Hey everybody, Johnny here. In the second part of this series, we looked at how we could use the group index of our accumulate field node to separate our boxes into separate piles. But maybe you wanna use something a little more complicated than a cube in your piles. In this video, we're gonna take a look at how we could take any geometry and make it work with these piles. Let's get into it. So if we wanna get rid of our cube, the first thing we'll do is delete it. Of course, now we're not instancing anything in our node tree, and so we've got nothing. So instead, I'm gonna take my group input geometry and drag it into my instance. Immediately you'll notice that although our original geometry was a cube, it's not working like the mesh primitive cube. The reason for that is the default cube in Blender is two meters by two meters by two meters, whereas the default mesh primitive cube is one meter by one meter by one meter. And since we're scaling by the same factor that we're spreading them out as, we have to have our objects with a scale of one. So the question is, how can we take any input geometry and scale it properly so that it fits, but also not distort that geometry? Let's see how we could accomplish that. If I have any number and I wanna scale it to one, I simply need to divide its value by itself. So say I have a length of 10, if I divide that by 10 or multiply it by 1 10 my new value is one. I'm gonna use this fact to our advantage. Here we can use the bounding box of our incoming geometry to find out how big it is. Here, I'm gonna drag out from this geometry reroute and type in bounding box. You'll want to have this be a separate branch of your incoming geometry because the output of your bounding box is not your original geometry. Instead, it's a cube, and that is the perfect cube that wraps around your object. Of course, in this case, our incoming object is a cube, so it really doesn't make a difference. But later on, it will make a difference. From this, we also have two vectors, minimum and maximum. These are the two opposing corners of our cube. If you were to put a box at the origin of our 3D space, the point that's in the negative, negative, negative quadrant would be our minimum, and the point that's in the positive, positive, positive quadrant would be our maximum. So we can use these two vectors to find the height, width, and depth of our bounding box. Because we wanna scale these along the z-axis, that's the component we wanna find out and use to scale our entire object. So to get the z distance of our bounding box, we're gonna add in two separate xyz nodes. Then we're gonna find the distance between the z's. Of course, to find the distance between two numbers on a number line, we simply subtract one from the other and take the absolute value. So we'll add a math node and set it to subtract. We'll subtract the two z's, we'll duplicate this node and set it to absolute. So the output of this socket is gonna be the z height of our bounding box. If we scale all three components of our incoming object by the inverse of this number, that will make the z height of our incoming object one. Of course, the x and y components will also be adjusted, but they won't necessarily be one unless our incoming object is identical in all three directions. So how do we scale our incoming object by the inverse of this amount? Well, the first thing we'll wanna do is add a geometry transform node. This gives us the ability to translate, rotate, or scale our geometry. Currently, if we plug this absolute value into scale, our cubes get even bigger. That's because the z height of the bounding box of our incoming geometry is two since our default cube has a height, width, and depth of two. So if we take the inverse of two, it becomes one half. The inverse of a number is simply one divided by that number. So I'll duplicate my absolute value node and change its mode to divide. I wanna put my value as the denominator and my top value as one. Let's run down this line of nodes one more time just so we make sure we know what's going on. We've taken the bounding box of our incoming geometry. We separate out the minimum and maximum vector and grab the z components of both. We subtract those from one another and take the absolute value. This gives us the height of two that we were looking for. We divide one by that number, giving us one half. And then we transform our original geometry by scaling it by one half. So our original geometry with a z height of two now has a z height of one. No matter what geometry we put in, its z height will be reduced to one, and then the x and y will be proportionally changed so that it retains its shape. Let's see how that looks. 
If I go into edit mode for my geometry nodes, I'm now editing my original cube. If I Now, if I were to add another object, say something like a torus, and add a geometry node tree to it, and then change this to my other node tree, you'll see that I end up with a nice stack of toruses. I can also use my split to make two separate piles. Of course, now you see that the split isn't working great with these larger objects. So maybe I want to be able to adjust how far apart these two are split. You'll remember that we used the output of our greater than or equal to to drive the X position of our second pile. We could simply multiply this value by some constant to make them further apart or closer together. Now, of course, we won't want this value to be hidden inside this node, so we'll drag it to our group input. And we'll name it split distance. Now, for each instance of our geometry node trees, we can control this distance. So that's it for this section of this tutorial. In the next video, we're gonna take a look at how to add multiple piles to our node tree beyond just two. So keep an eye out for that one. Thanks for watching. I hope this video inspires you to make something awesome. And until next time, I'll catch you later.